So uh, I'll be teaching a course called the Global 60s, uh, also at the Pontificia. Um, I teach history and uh, associate professor in the Department of History at SUNY Studybrook. Um, I was the former director of the Latin American and Caribbean Studies program at SUNY Studybrook, so I just ended that term. And uh, I've been writing on 1960s period from different angles. I still my dissertation was on, uh, which was a, a book um, called Refried Elvis on um, uh, the rise of the Mexican counterculture. So I was looking at a lot of youth politics, countercultural politics, middle class values, transnational uh, cultural phenomena, uh, mostly in the context of Mexico. Then I collaborated and did a big project on rock music in Latin America. Um, popular culture stuff. And then uh, over the, like, the last decade, I've shifted and um, become much more interested in the kind of geopolitical shifts and interlinking geopolitics with political change and ideological processes and culture in this period that we've come to call the, the long 1960s, or as I'll we'll talk about in a moment, the idea of the global 1960s. Um, so I've uh, published various stuff contributing to that, collaborated with people, um, that's how I know some of these folks in Uruguay and Chile and Argentina, who are also working on 1960s period, and this is this kind of new um, historiographical field that comes to be called the, the global 1960s. So um, I, what I thought I'd do was just read the synopsis, you know, the abstract of the syllabus for this course that I'm going to be teaching. Mostly I'm teaching this class. I have a, a smaller research component that I'll get to at the end here. So um, to invoke the term global 60s is to reference simultaneously a distinctive periodization, roughly 1958 to 1973, and a distinctive conceptual framework, one that takes as a given transnational linkages and interlocking causes. It is an error defined by the utopian optimism of a new world coming on the one hand, and the harsh realities of war, political repression, and the possibility of nuclear conflict on the other. Cultural revolutions, student protests, Cold War battles fought in the third world and Eastern Europe, and the radicalization of civil rights struggles in the United States all seem to converge. How do we make sense of the 1960s as a global set of experiences whose revolutionary heroes and imagery were deeply intertwined? Uh, this graduate level course examines the tumultuous global 60s from a thematic perspective, drawing upon a variety of secondary and primary sources, including film, music, and postcard. Focusing in particular on geopolitically peripheral actors, we will examine multiple contexts of the global 60s in our collective efforts to map out the simultaneity of revolutionary transformation and conflict while developing a methodological approach for researching and interpreting change from a variety of national and local perspectives. So the idea of this global 60s is that on the one, uh, hold on, well, you can that's okay. On the one hand, it's a new historiographical field, um, but one that uh, has mobilized and is coming to define new, what we would call epistemological framework, a way of sort of thinking and seeing um, social change, political change in this moment, um, which then implies new methodological um, uh, approaches to how do we research change from a transnational perspective. So it's those three kind of integrated elements. So one of the books uh, that's really kind of a foundational text for um, generating this paradigm comes from uh, this earlier 2005 by this guy, um, Ard Westad, uh, Westad, Ard Westad, who is uh, he's at Oxford and wrote really from a kind of geopolitical perspective, uh, talking about sort of you know, state actors, uh, but also integrating sort of state actors and ideological change. And his major contribution was that he shifted the concept of the Cold War away from the sort of US Soviet conflict to uh, look at the third world as constitutive actors of this Cold War. Um, so how the Cold War was both produced in and by the, the peripheral actors. And so he gives us this term, the global Cold War, uh, which then sort of pushes subsequent research um, into the, to, to look at the Cold War, War from the periphery and not from the centers, if you will, um, and thus transnationally. Um, 
And then that framework, and it's again premised mostly in terms of his work and some of his students who came from him, um, look more sort of from a kind of top down geopolitics and high state actors, but it then subsequently becomes embraced as this idea of global Cold War comes to be embraced by others who are working on questions of culture, um, ideology, and other sort of grassroots movements and uh, activist forces, um, especially sort of outside of the centers, outside of the United States, uh, Western Europe, where, where we tend to sort of think of the 60s happening, right, or traditionally shifts it out. And then in this last kind of decade, I'd say, um, have generated this new field that comes to be called the global 60s, which seeks to kind of integrate the geopolitical with the ideological political with the kind of grassroots cultural transnational. And so uh, if you go to the next slide, um, there's this massive tome um, that just came out recently, uh, which Hammock Global 60s, which is a phenomenal research. Uh, uh, we'll have lots to talk about in that regard. Um, but you know, premised on the idea of how, uh, this new concept of the global 60s, but also you know, purposefully sort of ignoring Western Europe and the United States, right? And really, you know, how do we think of the 60s, and not just in Latin America, but the 60s in the Middle East, the 60s in Southeast Asia, the 60s in Africa, the 60s in you know, uh, Poland, you know, the 60s in perif so-called peripheral places, um, and again, acted upon, but also generative of um, uh, you know, imaginaries, political actors, transnational spaces, etc. So this kind of constitutes this new field, right? Or it, it, in many ways, is concretizing the status of this this new field. So this course is going to uh, set this up, right? Um, for how do we sort of research it? How do we think about it? Um, and how do we place Chile? But really trying to go beyond just Chile, just like Latin America, to think about a global, global approach. Um, OK, so go to the next slide. So we'll be doing th three mon monographs. We'll see how this works, because it's difficult to obtain books, particularly in English here. But, um, so Jeremy Suri um, uh, will uh, look at his way. It's a very interesting first attempt to, to integrate culture and geopolitics. Um, he looks at the, the relationships between counterculture and student protest with larger geopolitical shifts. Uh, this guy, Quinn Slobodian, um, who's looking at um, uh, relationship between Africa, uh, African diaspora, Middle Eastern Africa, diaspora students in West Germany and sort of so placing uh, in East, well, East and West Germany um, and student culture. And then we're going to also read. I have a, a monograph, a second monograph that's uh, a gun about to come out. It'll come out in early uh, 2020. I'm going to receive the proofs while I'm here, so it'll be exciting. So I'm going to have um, our the class read that kind of over time as well, and um, uh, looks at from the perspective of Mexico, but is really trying to put Mex place Mexico in in a global context um, and integrate uh, geopolitics. In fact, my earlier Fulbright also was the kind of starting point of this project many years ago, actually, when it first started shifted into thinking about Mexico in the global 60s context before that term global 60s was really about. So um, OK, go to the next slide. So we'll do a number of sort of primary texts as we begin to you know, set things up and work through this. And I'll have the students sort of, you know, interrogate various aspects of these primary texts. Um, there's some, not all, but the sort of which is to think about language, to think about um, you know, shared imaginations, shared, shared metaphors, shared tropes, et cetera, right? The, the, the literary analysis aspects, but also questions of geopolitics. Uh, next slide. Um, and then, so I don't know if any of these names, I wasn't sure who the audience here would be per se, but um, some of these names may or may not be familiar. But, um, so it's a combination of some people who are Latin Americanists and some who are not. So Patrick Barmalech, who's a Chileanist, people may have heard he uh, 
published a book recently called Psychedelic Chile on the Chilean counterculture. Um, actually, Chilean counterculture during the Allende period would be great for you because it's this sort of flip side, you know, uh, those who are on the left but also targeted by the left, right, because they're countercultural, so they're as opposed to being militant, right? Um, so it's a, it's a great book. Uh, Jeff DeBurn writes about uh, Algeria, Van Goss, he's a, a U.S. historian, but writes a lot about Cuba and the influence of the Cuban Revolution on the rise of the, the new left in the United States, um, called Where the Boys Are, a kind of classic text. Tanya Harmer, who is a student of Agua Wedstad, uh, she's a Chileanist, she writes on the, on the Yende period. Um, Patrick Iber, who uh, has written a lot, um, oh, uh, on Congress Cultural Freedom, a lot of, of pre-Fulbright, but certainly USIA, and uh, you know, and looking at that in relationship to the Casa de las Americas and other fronts that are out there, um, etc. I will go through more. Aldo Armachesi, I mentioned to you, he's a Uruguayan. I'll definitely, he's coming to Santiago soon to give a talk on his a uh, book that came out, he's an NYU student, has a wonderful book on uh, the continental left uh, issues. So, uh, Vani Marcardian, um, also Uruguayan, um, did, she did her work at Columbia, he did his work at NYU, uh, also writes on um, Global 60 from Uruguay, she did wonderful work on, on the Uruguayan left and countercultural relationship with the, with the left, the uh, communist left in, in Uruguay. Um, uh, Vijay Prashad writes on some global stuff for uh, Alex Ross. Uh, and Alfonso Salgado, who's a Chilean, who has an article, um, recent art. He's, uh, uh, I want to say, Indiana University uh, grad student who's here somewhere. I haven't met him yet, but I know his stuff. But he writes on Chilean counterculture and in the Communist Party. Communist Party and countercultural basis of love and, and love and revolution. Okay, so we'll read some of that stuff, you know, bits and pieces, articles, chapters. Uh, okay, so central themes of the kind of course. Uh, hold on one sec, wait, go back, go back, go back. Yeah, there we go. So one will be the shift from this idea of an old left to a new left, which has to do with the idea of the role of the Communist Party, but also questions of revolutionary tactics and epistemologies. Um, and then the idea of, you know, these contestations within the new left. So you've got the Guevarista, you've got, you know, Maoismo, you've got, et cetera, right? Um, okay, so that's, that's a huge topic. Then uh, the other question is this idea of uh, solidarity and anti So the whole spirit of Bandung. So part of the global 60s agenda is to get us away from the impact of the Cuban Revolution, which in many ways kind of had sucked up the epistemological and historiographical sort of air in the room, sort of making everything reduced to Cuba for Latin America. And the global 60s is trying to, or at least my intent with global 60s is to get us away from Cuba per se and see Cuba situated, Cuban revolution situated within a wider array of forces. In fact, going back to Bandung, which is the conference in 1955, which kind of helped generate this idea of third world and the Algerian revolution and really trying to shift things and see Cuban revolution as part of you know, a larger project that's happened with reshuffling um, geopolitics and ideology on the left. Um, and tricontinentalism, which comes out of and it's part of that continuity. Um, and a, a final theme is to look at these competing ideas of revolution. So you have countercultural revolution, and then you have revolution of overthrowing the state, right? So same term, but really very different conceptions. Same thing with liberation, right? So these were kind of what we would call uh, you know, keywords of the global 60s, but really quite contested in many respects, uh, and the respective relationships to the idea of violence and um, you know, personal sub subjective liberation versus structural liberation, et cetera. Um, okay, so those are the three key ideas, and then go forward. Uh, so the key, the two main writing assignments, one is that we're gonna have them do a comparative analysis of two films that came out in 1968, um, The Old Submarine, Beatles film, and La Hora de los Hornos. Go ahead, you go know forward. So, um, La Hora de los Hornos, very, very classic film, produced uh, documentary style-ish um, by these two radical filmmakers, uh, Argentine filmmakers, very, very well-known film at the time, a subversive film, band film, and, and, um, and the El Submarine both came out at the same moment. 
they're both about revolution, they're both about liberation, they're both about love, but very, very different conceptualizations. So for me, these are kind of the two sides of the new left in, 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 in this period. So I'll have them do a, we'll watch the films or ask them, Laura, those sort of, like three hours long, so components. Um, and then, right about that. And the second is that they will write uh, either uh, an original research paper on what I call a protest icon, uh, which they can choose from the Chilean context or from another context. Well, I'll talk about that in a second. Or they could do an historiographical paper. So one would be kind of a research paper. The other would be more of an historiographical paper if, the, if they were so given that, that option. Um, so protest icon, just to give a sense of it. So this is my sort of next ongoing research project, which I'll uh, do a bit of. Well, here is to put the, so I call these this idea of icons of protest. So thinking about different uh, symbols, uh, we can move forward. So for example, uh, the peace symbol. And here's just, I know the Mexican context best, so my hope is being in Chile to explore a bit more of the South American context. But so for instance, so 1968, yeah, 1962 movement, so you know, the, 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 the V is, stands for, V for vencernemos, we will triumph, right? Uh, but it might also stand for you know, a peaceful kind of protest uh, uh, statement, uh, and then that gets transformed into, you know, the, the V of, uh, you know, of, of countercultural peace and love, right? So it's that contestation that, that we see often uh, of, you know, certain kinds. So that's an example of a protest icon in the ways in which it gets transnationalized, right, here at Countercultural Mexico, um, and has contested meetings. Uh, go forward, um, another example, La Minifalda. Um, I love that. I don't those of you Spanish here, la, la mini nos moda es un estado de ánimo, no? So this idea, you know, here the mini father is a great symbol of a transnational um, icon of protest, but of fashion, but of lots of, so various, various meaning. Um, again, Mexican context here. Uh, but you can read about, you know, the responses to the mini father globally, right? This is, this is the, the flapper of, of the 19, late 60s, right? Uh, okay, move forward. Another example, uh, long hair. Uh, here, Chile, example. So, okay, so long hair, you know, in the Latin American context, you know, is now also referencing indigenismo, so you've got a different kind of uh, valence of long hair, but it's also always in U.S. context, you know, becomes a certain a feminizing, right? So, there, so it becomes very uh, contested and uh, um, yeah, famously in Latin America, um, you know, you could get grabbed from the streets and forcibly have your hair cut, rapados, right? And that was happening everywhere in Latin America. In Latin America. Uh, and there's lots of discourse around the idea of long hair. Uh, move forward. Uh, Los Huarachis fascinates me. So because Los Huarachis get picked up by the Ameri you know, Ameri U.S. counterculture, but it's a referencing of the indigenous and those who are poor and the ways in which, you know, uh, that kind of symbol of protest gets reappropriated, right, and, and transnationalized. Ojotas, se llama. Ojotas. Las ojotas. Las ojotas. Sort of sandals. Sort of sandals made of tires. Uh -huh. uh, um, yeah. Ah, yes. Those tires. Oh, but, uh, I haven't seen. I, you know. Yeah. Tire rubber, rubber tires. I haven't yeah. seen people wearing them for a long time. Yeah. But yeah. yeah it's interesting, right? And in Mexico, the rubber on the bottom was always Goodyear. <laughs> Not, well, no, whatever, you know, Goodyear or any, any tire you can right. get hold of. No, but Goodyear was also, it's a transnational, right? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Right? So there are all sorts of things. Yeah, you're stepping on it. It's like dull plantation. Yeah. Uh, and one more. These are just examples. Uh, is the Pioma de la Paz. And I've started to write a bit about this, um, and I, I talk about this more in my book as well, but um, this to me is fascinating because uh, if you see on the far left, so La Pioma de la Paz is very much linked to uh, Soviet Front, which a uh, movement which is called the World Peace Council, uh, which comes out and basically comes alive in, after 1949, and so it gets adopted by uh, the left, the, the, the old left, right? The symbol of the old left. Um, here we see in that bigger thing that Las Cárdenas, famous Mexican uh, former president, uh, renowned revolutionary type, has very interesting connections with Cuba, later on, Cuban Revolution, and here we see the Pueblo de la Paz, right, so symbolizing the old left. Um, 
but then it gets transformed in many ways. Uh, here's just an example of the ways in which it gets picked up by the US peace movement. But um, So I'm very fascinated with the way that symbol gets moved. And for example, to what degree it shows up with the mirror or, or other leftist groups. Because by the early 70s, late 60s, the old left is is gone. You know, It's very much disparaged because we have the rise of the new left. But where is the, what happens to the peace stuff, right? Um, so. Yes. So this is a kind of an example that I'm hoping to push the students to do research projects related to aspects of the counterculture or the left that are transnational icons of protest. Um, and uh, for myself as well, to kind of keep my eyes open and try to do some research about it. So.